Welcome, 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 welcome. So delighted that you are here today. Uh, grateful that you're here. I know there's a lot of places that you could be, but you are in the presence of the Lord. I believe that God's got a word for you today. I could not wait uh, to preach this installment of this series. And I just believe uh, that if you feel like you're outside, God's gonna do something on the inside of your heart today. And uh, so come on, can we give it up for our worship team? Come on, can we praise God for them leading us in worship? Man, if you are visiting for the very first time, maybe you're just checking us out, maybe you've yet to come, and maybe you're kind of like feeling this whole thing out, I just want to welcome you. I um, know there's a lot of places you could be, but you are here, and we're delighted that you're here, honored that you're here, and uh, uh, if you are visiting, uh, there's a blue card in the seat and voc- pocket in front of you. If you'll do me a favor, man, it'll be my greatest honor. It's a highlight of my week is to be able to uh, find out how many blue cards we get, and if you'll fill out that blue card, uh, let us know that you're here today. It says, let's connect on it. Uh, and the, at the end of the service, you'll go to the lobby. You'll see some people in some green shirts. If you'll drop it off with them, say, I'm new. Uh, we've got a gift we want to put in your hand, just our way of saying thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. Wellspring, can we do it like we've never done it before? Come on, can we welcome our guests today? Come on, can we welcome them today? Welcome, 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 welcome. Uh, We're in the middle of a series called All In, and we've been spending the last three weeks, we'll end this series next week uh, with another in word, and uh, we'll end it, and then we'll go into our Holy Spirit series, talking about who the Holy Spirit is, and what he is, and all of that, and all that craziness. So it'll be a great, great series. You'll love it, love it, love it. But uh, we want to end this series well, and uh, so for the next two weeks, I'm going to talk to you about two words, indispensable and invested. Uh, But before we get there, before we go, I want to remind you, you saw the video. Um, our men's conference, uh, Warrior Conference, is coming up real, real quick, uh, like literally around the corner, less than four weeks away. And if you've yet to register, I, I literally, I think there's like 20, 22 spots left. And so there's not many, many spots left. So if you want to register, we cap it at 136. So if you want to register, now's the time. Don't wait. Um, and let me, do, I think this is a beautiful moment uh, for you ladies to like force your husband to be there. Let me say it this way. If you will bless him with perks, I bet you he will show up at Warrior Conference. So get registered. And all the men said, uh, that didn't go for the men, they're already registered, all right? But uh, if you've yet to register, register, register. You can scan the QR code there, October the 19th through the 21st. It's golf and, uh, and uh, there's, uh, uh, what's the word, shooting, there's fishing, uh, warrior games, incredible, credible services, uh, half decent food, good beds, it'll be fantastic. And so, listen, God's called you to be the leader of your home. And where the leaders of the family go, where the men of the family go, so goes the family unit. It's all about the men. God's called the men to step up and lead, not in an authoritative, overbearing way, but to lead in the way that God, so get there. Nudge your husband, boyfriend right now. This is the moment. You can nudge them. Nudge them right now. Nudge them right now. Nudge them. Punch them. No, just kidding. But get them there, okay? Uh, Get them there. And secondly is this. um, Tonight is our second event of the year. Uh, We call it Bunkos and Bowls. It's a young adults event. And so if you are a young adult, 18 to 29-year-old, get registered. You can scan the QR code right there. It'll be happening at 530 out in the main lobby. They'll be playing Bunko. If you don't know what Bunko is, just show up. If you don't know what Bulls are, just show up. Um, You may see somebody that's pretty here. So come on. It'll be a fantastic time in the presence of Jesus. I'm going to pray. And uh, we're going to dive into the message. You ready? Are you ready for the word? Come on, you ready for the word? Man, I'm ready to preach. I really, really feel like there's a fire in my bosom uh, when it comes to this message. And I just want, I want, you to, I want you to feel the opposite of what this woman felt. And so let me pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We ask that uh, you would invade our hearts. Um, that we would feel you, you would change us from the inside out, and that uh, we would be radically, radically, radically changed uh, to be the person that you've called us to be and further the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said, uh, let me start out by saying this, if you've got your notes. Uh, I need you to know today that God's love is not indicative of your love for him. Let me me say it another way. God's love is not indicative of your pursuit of him. God's love for you is completely and 100% indicative of his character and nature. God God loves you because his character loves you. God, God loves you because inside of God is to love you. And so when I say things like these two words, you are, you're indispensable. 
You need to know it comes from not really who you are, but who he sees you to be. Does that make sense? So when I say you're indispensable, that wall comes up for some of you. You're like, you don't know my past, you don't know my history, you don't know the scarlet letter, you don't know what I did last night, you don't know what addiction or how many divorces or how many this or that's or bank account or church attendance, you don't, you don't know. So when I say you're indispensable, I need you to see it through the lens of the character of God. That God, God could not not love you. Does that make sense? I know that's wrong English. God has to love you. God is indic the indicative nature and character of God is to tell you over and over and over again that you are indispensable. Now, you may not feel that way. In fact, a few months ago, I was on a mission trip with uh, 14 other men. We went to uh, Spain, and I, it was a construction mission trip, so you already know I'm a leg down when it comes to that. But it was uh, screws and nails and wood and metal and measurements. Homeboys out when it comes to that. And they were picking on me, and some of them hurt, but most of them didn't. But some of them were little digs, and I realized very quickly, it took me about three hours to realize, I feel very invaluable. I feel very insecure. I feel very unequipped to be measured up into this room. I can't build anything, I can't measure anything, I don't know how to cut anything, I know nothing. I don't even think I'm a man, can I be honest with you? I'm just, I'm not very good at that stuff. Nobody taught me that and so I just don't know how to do that. And so I felt the opposite of indispensable. But I realized, it took me a day and a half to realize I can serve two purposes on this trip. Number one, I can make, I made 32 trips to their version of Home Depot. Come on, somebody, I can do that. <laughs> and number two, I can bring back one of three McDonald's cheeseburgers in the town, cheeseburgers for everybody, I can do that. Cheeseburgers and Home Depot runs. Come on, I got my skills and talents right there. But I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't feel indispensable. I felt invaluable, I felt a little bit demeaned, I felt like I wasn't very good at anything. And so I know what it's like to feel the opposite of indispensable. But what I've learned over the last few years as I've been walking this thing called Christianity, I've learned that there's one key word to living a life of a person who's indispensable. And that is this word, if you're taking notes, it's this word, consistency. It's consistency. A person who's indispensable has good rhythms. They have good routines. They get up in the morning, they do the same thing. They go to bed the same way. They eat the same food. They, their workout routine is the same. They go to work the same way. They drive their kids to school the same way. They live a life of consistency. There's good rhythms. And when you have good rhythms, you can have this good life of being a person who's indispensable. Write this down if you're taking notes. See, transformation happens when you do consistently what everybody else does occasionally. I want you to write that down. You wanna live a life of indispensable people. It requires you to focus on the little things. In fact, it's the small things that give you great results. See, I didn't know this as an early dad. I thought, can you put a lot of other people who want to try and take pictures and like they had this like, oh, uh, I didn't get it. Can you throw that back up there real quick? Uh, but I thought, um, I, I actually thought that as a young dad, I actually thought that the, the things that our kids needed were moments, big moments. Like they need big trips and big vacations and big this and big that. And I learned very quickly that our kids don't need big moments. They need daily consistent moments with their mom and their dad. So a few weeks ago, I was working on this message and I asked April, I said, babe, can you tell me about your life? And I knew a lot, we grew up together, but I knew a lot about her life. And I said, what, what tell me about your parents when it came to, came to consistency. She goes, that's easy. She goes, let me tell you about my mom. My mom lived a life of consistency when it came to the word of God. Every single morning when I got up to get ready for school, my mom was in the Bible. She studied the word. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't see my mom's Bible open. Her mom right now, she has dementia, and even to this day, she still reads her Bible. I think seriously, sometimes she reads like three or four times because she forgets she read it, but she reads it every single day. She said, what about you? And I said, well, that's easy. 
When I think about the home that I brought, was brought up in, it's very easy for me to tell that you that my mom lived a life of consistency when it came to church attendance. Church wasn't an option for me. We didn't choose sports over church. We didn't choose uh, uh, this event over sports. We didn't choose the beach over sports. Like my mom, whether she was sick or whether she had something else better to do, my mom lived a life of consistency. And I'll just tell you right now, uh, Mike and Robin, April's parents, have two daughters that serve Jesus with their entire life because their parents lived a life of consistency with the word of God. My mom has two sons that love Jesus and serve Jesus with our entire lives because my mom was consistent when it came to church attendance. What am I trying to tell you? A person who is indispensable has a consistent routine of life that results in good. It's a life of consistency. See, write it down this way. Small things done consistently almost always trump big things done occasionally. See, you can go out and run a marathon once a year, or you can choose to exercise 15 minutes a day. You can go on one vacation to fix your marriage, or you can choose to get in godly community and weekly spend time with people of like faith and like seasons. You can go on a three-day retreat and think a three-day retreat is gonna fix your life, or you can spend 15 minutes in God's word every single day, and you'll watch the small things start to transform who it is that God has already said you to be, and that is indispensable. I want to tell you a core truth because some of you right now, you don't feel indispensable. You feel if there was an opposite of indispensable, maybe invaluable would be the opposite of that or unvaluable, you feel that way. And I want to tell you a core truth and I want to speak to a group of people. I want to preach to everybody today. But I want to speak to a group of people that you sit in church today and you feel like you're not connected. In fact, just last week, we were in our executive team meeting at Uh, One of our pastors came in just upset because a lady who checked in her kids, she sat on one of these uh, tables out here for a good 15 minutes and he saw her and she's crying and he said, what's wrong? And she said, well, I've been sitting here and four or five people have walked past me and nobody said anything. I just don't feel like I'm noticed. So I wanna speak to the person that doesn't feel noticed. You don't feel valuable. You feel like that you're not a part. You don't fit in. I want, you to talk, I want to talk to you today around this idea that one of the core statements of the mission of Jesus is this. Jesus invites people that others reject over and over again. Jesus invited people that didn't look like everybody else. Jesus invited, we learned this last week, the Samaritan woman. She didn't look like everybody else. Jesus invited the Pharisees in, in and they didn't look like everybody else. Jesus was constantly inviting the sinner. Come on, the sinner. He he always invited the person who wasn't like everybody else into whatever it is and wherever it was Jesus was at. I want to show you a story today. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 7. Let me set it up this way. Luke chapter 7, Jesus has been journeying with his teaching ability. He is a really, really good teacher. Many people have been getting saved. People have been healed. Uh, lots of, lots of ministry. The reputation of Jesus has grown significantly over the entire region of Israel. The Pharisees have caught wind of this, and the Pharisees are the religious people of the day. And let me remind you, Jesus came to actually replace religion and have a relationship with people. The Pharisees wanted religion, do's and don'ts. Jesus said, let's do this in relationship, and you'll learn how to do the life, not the reverse. It's this full truth, full grace thing. And so the Pharisees had caught wind about Jesus, and they were having what is called their dinner parties, And they said, why don't we invite Jesus to one of our dinner parties? Now, that was abnormal because Jesus wasn't like them and they weren't like Jesus. Jesus loved them, but they did not love Jesus. Now, we don't know why Jesus was invited to this dinner party. Most likely it was out of peer pressure or they wanted to stump Jesus or there was some strategic marketing strategic marketing systems that Jesus had figured out when it comes to his followers that the Pharisees needed to learn. One way or another, we know that Jesus shows up at this dinner party. Now, I gotta describe it for you because if you were having a dinner party, and let's just say it's August, but not January in Florida, but let's just say it's August and January. If you're having a dinner party, you would invite people on the inside where there's air conditioning. But they didn't do that. 
So their dinner party would, the picture that I have in my mind is like a South Carolina, North Carolina, maybe Georgia home where you've got this big house and there's a wraparound porch around the, the house. So what would happen is their dinner party would be out on the outskirts of the porch, the courtyard, and they would come over and the Pharisees would be having what is called their dinner party. And they would talk about like uh, real big theological conversations like uh, dispensationalism and pneumatology and eschatology and hermeneutics and homiletics and all of these words that I don't even know how to spell because I'm from Ruskin. And so they would be talking about all these words. Jesus gets invited and everybody is excited because they want to be in the room when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Now, there wasn't TV shows like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or Jerusalem, but everybody wanted to hear. It would almost be like uh, Brooks Kepka and Bryson DeChambeau in a conversation. If you're a golfer, you'd want to see that. You'd want to hear that. you want to experience that. Or, or maybe Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift in one room. Are they dating? Are they not dating? Come on, somebody tell me the truth. Are they together? Are they not together? Like, I don't really know. I can't figure it out. Or, or Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. Like, I'd want to be involved. What are they going to talk about? What are they, what's going on? Or if your pastor got invited to the Cat Lovers Association of Florida, you'd want to be involved in that conversation. Would you not want to? <laughs> so everybody wanted to hear. Everybody wanted to hear. By the way, if there was, I would not be invited to that. I can promise you that. <laughs> but that's the setup. They're having this dinner party. Everybody wants to hear because everybody's, it's like a popcorn eating moment. What is Jesus and the Pharisees going to talk about? Everything was going as planned until it didn't. And it wasn't because Jesus showed up or because Jesus said something. Something so unexpected happened at this dinner party that it radically changed the entire region. A woman shows up. Now, we don't know who this woman is. The Bible doesn't tell us. If you were to ask me who I think it is, I think it was Mary Magdalene. I think it was Mary Magdalene in John chapter seven and in John chapter eight. Uh, Jesus really, really loved Mary Magdalene. He had a very close relationship with Mary Magdalene. And and I think that this woman in John seven is Mary Magdalene. And if you disagree, that's okay. But nonetheless, a woman shows up at this dinner party, unexpected and uninvited, and she shows up. Luke chapter seven, verse 37. Say, I'm here. Say, I'm here. Okay, here we go. Luke chapter seven. Then a certain immoral woman, by the way, that's code for town prostitute, slut, woman who gets around town. This woman shows up. She's a sinner. She's a reprobate. She sells her body for money. She shows up to this dinner party with Jesus and the Pharisees from the city that she had heard that Jesus was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. We learn later in the gospel that this probably was the equivalent of a year's wages. She had been saving it for a year, but she brings this alabaster jar and the Bible says, verse 38, she knelt down In the middle of this dinner party, she kneels down at Jesus' feet. Now, you gotta get this picture. When they were reclining, when the Bible says that they were reclining at the table, you need to know this, that Jesus most likely was sitting back in a rocker and his feet were on the table. So when this woman shows up, I'm sure his feet hit the floor and he probably was attuned to her and she began to sit at his feet. Goes on, verse 38. Then she knelt behind him, weeping, probably uncontrollably crying. Like, like, like crying. Like you're like, you know what that crying is like. Crying, sobbing, snot coming everywhere. Just don't care what anybody thinks about her. And then it says, she wiped her tears that landed on Jesus' feet. I mean, you know you're crying a lot at the tears you're following, falling on somebody's feet in a way that you can see them. And it says that she took her hair and she wiped his feet. Now listen, you gotta understand this. This is jaw-dropping. Because this would have been like a woman exposing her breast in public. 
Like he would never do that. So when she pulls her hair out of her bun, the entire region is like, oh snap. I cannot, I mean they are talking about her, gossiping about her. I cannot believe she lowered her hair. She's interrupting our hermeneutics conversation. She's wiping the feet of Jesus. She's, who invited this woman? And so the person, the Pharisee, who was the leader of the dinner party, has a conversation with himself, but out loud so that everybody else could hear him. You ever done that before? You're like saying something and you, you want everybody to hear you, but you're acting like you don't want everybody to hear you? Oh, I'm preaching to somebody, married people. Verse 39. So when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself under his breath, but people heard him. If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Now this created a problem. This created a problem for the Pharisees. This created a problem for the woman. This created a problem for everybody. But can I just tell you, this did not create a problem for Jesus. Jesus was well aware that she was deemed as nasty and disgusting and despised. And Jesus was well aware that she was deemed as somebody with a problem. Jesus was not surprised by this woman showing up at that dinner party. Not surprised at all. Now, before we move on from this story, I have to ask you a question. Now, I realize that in a room this full, I realize that there's a few cynical people in this room, probably men, just being real with you. And, and you're so cynical that you feel like that person got themselves in the mess. You've lost compassion, you've lost sympathy, you have become what the world would call calloused to caring for people. And that's okay, I'm not talking to you. Jesus will handle you. But for those of you that aren't calloused and cynical and are still a little bit compassionate, can I ask you this question? Do you think this woman wanted to be in this condition? Like, think about it. Do you think she genuinely wanted to be a prostitute? The town slut. Do you think she wanted to? Do you think at the end of the day that was her desire? Like, like when she was eight years old, she sat at a sleepover with all of her girlfriends and they were talking about what they were gonna do when they got older and one girl says, I wanna be a, uh, I wanna be a teacher and one girl says, I can't wait to be a mom and one girl says, I, I, I can't wait to be a lawyer. One, 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 one girl says, I, I can't wait to be a doctor and a pediatrician and, and it got to her and she said, I can't wait to be a prostitute and a slut and sell my body for money. No, of course she didn't say that. What young girl at 13 does this? I have a 13 year old daughter. I can promise you, 13 year old girls do not desire that. So it leaves us with this question. Why is she one then? The Bible says she's a prostitute. She's the town slut, why? How'd she get there? What got her to this place? I mean, I mean, it very well could be that she grew up in a home without parents. And her parents died in a car crash or a plane crash or, and she got left with the little brother and little sister. No family would take them in and the only thing that she could do at 13 years old to provide food for the family is to sell her body. We don't know. It, it could be that a stepdad had sexually abused her. And the only way she knew how to hurry up her stepdad doing what her, her stepdad was doing to her is to just be quiet and to just give in and to just be okay with that. I mean, I mean it could have been she was at a party and there was a young boy there and he offered her a drink, and when he offered her a drink, he slipped something in her drink, and she woke up the next morning and had no idea of what happened, although it required her to go to the hospital. It could be she got married. And one night, late at night, her and her husband were fighting, and he called her a slut. Whore, prostitute, stupid, 
And it was verbal, but he got up the next morning and he apologized. He was regretful and he was sorry and he knew he shouldn't have said it. But three weeks later, it happened again. Although this time it wasn't verbal, he actually open hand slapped her. And he apologized and he got the flowers and the, and the chocolates and he took her out to dinner and he, he was regretful, but it happened. And, and then later it became an open fist, it came a closed fist and it required the cops to be called. We don't know. But here's what we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt. This woman is a prostitute and she did not desire to be in this situation, but something happened to her to cause her to believe she is not valuable. She is the opposite of indispensable. Nobody would invite her to the party. And she is unloved and unworthy. And the only way out is to sell her body for resources. Now, the other thing that is very clear, are you with me today? The other thing that's very clear is this. She has had to of heard Jesus preach before. True? I mean, just put yourself in the story. I mean, for her to interrupt a dinner party and to step into a situation that she wasn't invited to, she must have heard somebody talk about Jesus or hear Jesus preach. It was either earlier that day, earlier that week, but at some point she had heard Jesus talk because she had knew if she gave Jesus a year's wages sobbing at his feet that this was the only solution to fix her eternal problem. Now, we don't know this for sure, but we're reading out of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of Matthew tells us the event that happens before this dinner party. There's an event that happens earlier that day, and the Gospel of Matthew records it. In Matthew chapter 11, the Bible says Jesus is having a conversation with John the Baptist and some leaders, they're tired and they're weary, and here's what Jesus says to John the Baptist and the leaders. Read it with me. He says this, come to me. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. This is earlier that day. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch, out. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy because you picture her in the crowd. Ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Could you imagine, whether it's Mary Magdalene or some other woman, could you imagine this woman hearing this story from a distance, trying to get close that morning to Jesus, knowing that Jesus could fix her problems, but also knowing that if she doesn't get to him this morning, that there's a dinner party at the house across the street, and maybe, just maybe, just maybe, she could get there. Can you imagine the emotion that must have welled up inside of her all day long until she gets to the dinner party and realizes Jesus will welcome me and fix all of my problems. Now, let me say this to you before I go any further. I need you to know that John chapter one, verse 14 says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. The word full means complete. Jesus is not 50% grace and 50% truth. Jesus will give you hard truth that hurts your feelings and he will wrap it in grace. And let me just tell you something around Wellspring. We will never contradict this word of God. If the word of God tells us how to do marriage, we're gonna preach how to do marriage. If the word of God teaches us how to do finances, we're gonna teach how to do finances. We will not lean way too far into grace that we skimp on truth and we will not be 18 foot long Baptist preacher finger in your face truth that we eliminate grace. We're gonna be both. Why? Because Jesus was both. So maybe you're here and you simply do not feel indispensable. You don't feel that way. You feel unvaluable. And you want to, you're hearing me preach and you want to, but you just don't feel that way. You feel like the woman. You feel like this woman who all she has to do is to give to Jesus, but recognizing, I just don't know if I can. Maybe you're in the waiting pattern. And you've got junk in the trunk, 
and you find yourself at the dinner party and you believe that Jesus can fix your issue, but you realize that you live in a broken, broken, broken world. Let me end by giving you a couple things today. Number one is this. Listen to me. This is a huge, huge deal for somebody. You gotta recognize the value of the process. Recognize the value of the process. Why? Why? Because God does. God is about taking you on a journey. God is about taking you on a process. God rarely will hear you, heal you in a moment. God takes you on a journey. Oftentimes, God wants to do something in you before he does something through you. Oftentimes, God wants to do something in you before he does something to you. God is about the process. He's about making sure that you are right and whole and ready to receive whatever it is that you've been asking him to receive. See, life will throw a lot of things your way. And you've heard this somewhere before. But life is 1% what happens to you and 99% how you respond to it. Some of you in this room, you've been through some really difficult things and you would love to change what happened to you, but the truth of the matter is that's really not what you wanna do. What you really wanna do is to change how you respond to what happened to you. First Peter chapter one says this, so be truly glad. There is wonderful, listen, this is a word for somebody. There is wonderful joy ahead of you. Your days tomorrow are better than your yesterdays. Even though you must endure many trials, some pain, some issues for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. See, there's an enemy of your destiny. But the enemy of your destiny is not that person or that situation or that thing that happened to you. The enemy of your destiny is not a person. The enemy of your destiny is fear, sadness, discouragement. The enemy of your past is not what happened to you. The enemy, I mean, sorry, the enemy of your future is not what happened to you. The enemy of your future is how you respond to what happened to you. God is taking you on a process. Allow, Bible says that we are to what? Work out our salvation. I don't wanna theologically go down a road that I can't recover from in the couple minutes that I have left. But when the Bible says to work out your salvation, what it means is this. You, when you get saved, you get the imputed righteousness of God at the moment you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he is still working out the salvation. That's the imparted righteousness of God. That is the sanctification part. God has got you in a sanctification process where he's trying to redeem you, make you whole, make you right. He's reworking you back to your original factory settings before you walk through life the way that you walk through life. Are you hearing me today? So just allow the full work of God to work in your life. Here's number two, is refuse. This is massive. Refuse to let offense step in. Refuse to let offense stop you. R refuse to let offense step into your situation. See, listen, the closer the relationship, the more likely for intimacy. Right? But the closer the relationship, the more likely chance for offense. So the closer the relationship, intimacy, but the closer relationship, offense. And so if you're walking in a fence, one word and one simple action could redeem you to the other side of a fence. See, forgiveness takes one person. Reconciliation takes two people. Let me teach you something today. When you were created, you were created as one person. But then God puts us in a community, whether marital community, relational community, uh, whether brotherhood community, you're, you're put, and what happens, the, 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 the two become one. But then the devil comes into your situation when life throws stuff your way, and the devil comes into your oneness, and he actually says you're no longer one, you're actually two. See, what God has redeemed, Satan is trying to break up. An offense will do that. I mean, think about Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament. I mean, homeboy had some really difficult days. He was sold into slavery. His brothers hated him. I mean, he gets into Pharaoh's uh, house and, and then he has to live as a slave and it's awful, awful, awful. And then he, he has some incredible moments and the but butcher and the baker are gonna rescue him and he, he's so excited he's gonna be rescued and then that doesn't happen and then he has to stay. And then finally, Joseph comes to the end of his life 
end of his life. And Joseph is face to face with the people who hurt him, shamed him, punished him, scolded him, tried to kill him. And Joseph looks at his brothers square in the eye and he says, Genesis 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. It is God. Man, that's a powerful statement. It is God who brought me to this realization. And when God brought me to this realization that this is a part of God's plan, his redemptive plan, now I can go and use my story to save people who are walking through the same things that I'm walking through. What am I trying to tell you today? You are indispensable. God has called you and God has equipped you. God has set your feet on solid ground. He sees you differently than you see yourself, but you're in process. Allow God's process to be worked out in your life. Do not let fence to, offense to lead you every step of the way. And listen to me. Well, I'm older. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, it was a long time ago. Listen to me. Let me tell you a biblical principle. What is not healed is handed down. What is not healed is handed down. Whatever it is that you don't allow to get healing in your life, you will hand it down to the next generation. To your kids, to your grandkids, to the people that you lead, to the student, you will hand it down. Listen to me. That's why we are all about freedom. That's why after Warrior Conference, we're taking the men through freedom. That's right, right now, about 100 ladies are going through freedom. Why are we taking you through freedom? Because if you don't get healing from the thing that you're walking through, you will hand it down to the next generation. Why did I come to church today? I came to church today to tell somebody they're indispensable. You're indispensable. And what you did wasn't foolish, and what God wants to do and through you is gonna make everybody else foolish. You are invited to the party. You are indispensable. God has called you. God has equipped you. God's gonna do supernatural things through you. Come on, does anybody believe that in the house today? Does anybody believe that? You are. So would you do me a favor? Would you bow your head and close your eyes with every head bowed and with every eye closed and with nobody looking around? I'd love to just pray with you. Father, I thank you for every single person within the sound of my voice, every single person that is wrestling and difficult, every single person. We play the keys whenever we want. If you're hurt, you're struggling, maybe you're in a difficult place, maybe you're, maybe you're realizing that you've got a lot of junk in the trunk, maybe you realize that you've got a lot of BC days and you've got a lot of issues and you're going, how could God use me? I pray today that we realize that just like this woman in John chapter seven, that God looks at us through the eyes of Jesus and he says, you are, you're indispensable. You're my favorite prized possession. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again for you. God looks at us through the eyes of Jesus and he says, when I see you, I don't see sin. I see the savior of the universe. I pray that somebody in this room would receive that this morning. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'll tell you, the Bible says that if we don't, we will spend an eternity away from him. But if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that means this. That means you get to spend all of eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this beautiful place called paradise. And you're gonna spend all of your existence, eternal existence with Jesus Christ. But I realize that some of you have never done that before. Man, you've been to church, you've threw a few bucks on the offering plate, you've tried to live a good life, you've been a good person, but you can't remember a moment where you've given your life to Jesus, you've trusted him as Lord and Savior. If you've never done that before, the Bible says today's the day of salvation. So here's what I want you to do. If you've never done that before, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you heal me? Be my Lord and Savior. I need you. I believe the cross. I believe in the resurrection. And I believe that I spent eternity with you. I give you all of my sin and I receive you as my savior. Now, if you're in this room and you prayed that prayer, I just wanna know who I'm praying with. If you prayed that prayer, would you just lift your hand up just so I can see you? Just wanna know who I prayed that with. You prayed that right here? Awesome. I see a couple people right here. See this? See, I see you, I see you. Anybody else? I won't embarrass you, I promise you. Anybody else? I know people get nervous and embarrassed. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Several of you. Here's what I want you to do. In just a moment, guys, these few, few right here in the front row, sweet lady right here, here's what I want you to do. In just a moment, we're gonna stand and we're gonna worship. Here's what I need you to do. Please do this favor for me. 
We want to, we want to help you. We want to help you on this journey. We want to help you on this journey, guys. So here's what I need you to do. We're going to stand, and there's some people on the back tables in the back, and they're ready. They've been praying for you all week. They've been praying for you for this moment. And they've been saying, man, I cannot wait to pray for somebody. So when everybody's standing and they're distracted with what's up here, you're going to make your way in the back, and they're going to be right there waiting on you. They just want to give you a big hug. They want to help you with your next steps. Will you do that for me? Will you do that for me? Awesome. Let's stand. Let's stand. Father, we open up our hearts and our minds as we worship you. We invite our prayer team up here. Maybe you need to come to the altar. Maybe you need to go to the cross. Maybe you need to come light a candle. Maybe you need to take communion. Whatever it is, respond. Several of you that you gave your life to Jesus. As soon as we start singing, you just make your way. There's tables in the back. You see the light right there. We just want to help you. We want to help you get plugged in. Help you begin this new faith and journey with Jesus Christ. Amen.